uh, to have with us uh, Yanis Pandis uh, today from uh, J&J Innovation and J&J Technology. Um, Yanis Pandis will be speaking on the topic of digital medicine, medicine and therapeutics, uh, therapeutics, sorry, um, offering a pharma perspective. So uh, that is, of course, a very influential and important perspective on the whole area. Um, I think the pharma companies um, are really these days putting a lot of effort into the digital health space, and this is starting to show everywhere uh, in 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 the field uh, from small scale to large scale initiatives. Um, Dr. Yanis Pandis is the director of digital health technology and partnerships at J and J Innovation in the oncology uh, oncology therapeutic area, as well as the business technology leader for J and J um, Technology. Uh, he holds a PhD in uh, biochemistry um, from BSRCL Fleming Institute in essence, and has been a senior working member at j, &J uh, for multiple years. Um, he has also been an, an important partner, um, co uh, and collaborator in multiple large-scale uh, research efforts, amongst them um, flagship uh, size IMI projects, including the concluded eTrix and ongoing IdeaFast projects, which is actually where I um, got to know uh, Yanis. Uh, as a um, collaborator on a work package that we um, led together for a certain uh, time, um, at which I got to know uh, Yanis as a, as a true expert in the field uh, with hands-on experience, uh, but also extremely well networked and in the know about things, which is why I approached him to give a keynote uh, at our session today, um, linking the perspectives as we just heard them here with quite a focus on local impact and deployments, uh, into the wider field. Um, so I'm very happy um, that we uh, could win you over to do this talk today. And I would say uh, for the for the next few minutes, uh, the floor is yours. And then we have a little bit of a Q&A afterwards. Again, type your questions as you have some during the talk and we'll catch up uh, in writing afterwards. Um, thank you. And uh, yeah, please go ahead with your talk. Thank you very much, Jan. Thank you very much for inviting me to give this uh, to give a talk at your wonderful um, symposium. Uh, essentially, I'd like to again thank Jan for your collaboration over the past few years, uh, especially in the in the context of IdeaFast, which uh, of course will get a mention in this talk. So, without further ado, let me share my screen. Um, can everyone see the screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Just just to make sure that we I put this out here, these are I'm going to be widely providing a, my own views around uh, digital health, digital medicine, digital therapeutics. This is not by any way means a nothing in of J and J or its affiliates. So. Let's start off with uh, with a little bit of a provocative. Um, question. So is digital health a buzzword? I think, you know, we wouldn't be here having this, um, these uh, presentations if we didn't know it's much something more than a buzzword. But over the years, it's been used to, to encompass every, every single thing from essentially apps following that you can log your, um, your own personal well being or diet and journaling to weight loss or just um, scales, but also um, it goes into a little bit more serious and evidence-based um, modalities that you can measure. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on these slides. This is just to provide the overview. What we consider essentially as being digital health is the convergence of science and technology, pretty much like um, data science is now or beforehand where the way that we were able to, um, to um, map out the human genome by, by marrying science, technology, mathematics, all of the different disciplines. So you have artificial intelligence, data science, um, all the different um, flavors of reality, virtual, augmented, um, coming in, internet of things, wearables, invisibles, mobile health, blockchain, 5G, quantum, everything coming into one essentially under the, which could um, help us more move uh, medicine and um, forward. This is my one of my favorite slides ever. Um, I don't like wordy slides, but this one I think is perfect to exemplify what we are talking about. 
So um, as I said, digital health has been used as a catch-all term to, to monitor everything. If you look at digital health on the app stores of your favorite mobile device, you'll find so many apps coming up. Really what we in pharma look at is the two columns to the right. So essentially digital medicine and digital, digital therapeutics, which do require clinical evidence um, as part of their underlying um, way of working. So they have been checked against, against um, existing clinical measures where possible. And there has been evidence generated that what, we, what is measuring is aspects of human disease or health. And then the digital therapeutics, of course, is when we deliver intervention. So this specific slide, I love to put it out first and any talk to make sure that we're talking about these two and not necessarily every single thing that cover, comes under digital health when you search about it on the internet. So you essentially have um, diagnostics, biomarkers, uh, electronic clinical outcome assessment, remote patient monitoring, decision monitoring software, um, you can, when we're going into the therapeutics side of things, we're talking about medical claims, how to treat a disease. One of the things which, which is most pronounced, and I'm sure this audience will know this, um, are the, the pivotal work, flagship work done by pair therapeutics in, the, um, in trying to um, provide digital therapeutics for, um, for neuropsychiatric diseases, where it's much more capable of, uh, of applying behavioral changes through uh, different apps and uh, through means and apps and that, that can essentially treat um, disease. So we like to call it in pharma alongside the pill. We're not in pharma have gone to the side where we can only purely use digital therapeutics, but we also like to augment our existing uh, pharmaceutical interventions a lot with digital ones, which can offer enhanced uh, efficacy. This is an old slide um, that's... Um, that was collected or produced by the, or by the, the rock star of the, of the digital medicine uh, or digital health area, Eric Topol, um, showing how essentially um, digital health has impacted research clinical trials um, in recent years. As I said, it's outdated, so I'm sure that if we were able to, to revise this slide, we would have much more evidence. But it's just a means of showing that it actually does become impactful because the first thing that you that you face within a pharmaceutical company that's used to doing clinical trials to check drugs is so why should I consider your fancy little techie toy in my in my study? And you have to provide some evidence that it will will enhance uh, the, um, the the trial itself and it will it will actually, make sure that you can monitor aspects that you were not able to monitor before or monitor as frequently as needed. And one other big thing that I wanted to just put out here, and Jan knows this very well, it was one of the, the key things that we pursued in IdeaFast and we're still pursuing as a project, is um, the regulatory validation. So within pharma, you like to obviously collect all meanings of health and disease to enhance your own research, but it's also very, very useful to have endpoints that you can use for filing. So to show that, for example, that my drug um, really does affect a, um, an aspect of human health that the patient cares about. So this is just one of these um, lovely depictions of a schematic of um, how the regulatory validation happens. This was collected by the Clinical Transform Trial Transformations Initiative, which was um, itself a partnership and shows one of the frameworks. Now, if you, of course, go to the FDA now or the EMA, they'll provide their own frameworks that we use routinely when we're, um, when we're preparing um, submission to make sure that an M a digital endpoint is validated and can be used for claims with a drug. So moving on, this is one of the, um, the frameworks that was proposed and used in, in one of the, the teams that I led a while back, um, which, which kind of led to, the, to our involvement in the IdeaFast program. Jan will probably recognize this as being something similar to what we eventually used in, in the IdeaFast project, which I'll talk about afterwards. Um, and essentially, it's just talking about how you approach uh, digital health. So you look at uh, essentially what, what the patients care about, what endpoints need, need to be digitalized. 
some of the things which are very, very difficult to capture and essentially are always captured by patient reported um, patient reported outcomes um, diaries um, and so and so on and so forth to date are things like fatigue, sleep, pain, cognition, and mood disorders as well as of course disease activity, which is more measured. So I'm sort of leaving that with the and just to show that you know, it's not necessarily just collected with patient reported outcomes. So you, you see what, what you care about. These are the difficult ones. We, these are the ones that, that a, a clinician can't necessarily um, prescribe a drug or prescribe ways to help with because it's not really, um, they don't have strong data in order to know how well um, or badly patients are doing with them. So what we do is we develop a toolkit to be able to measure these endpoints, whether that is um, wearable sensors, study apps, web portals, point of care biomarker devices, so lab on chip devices where you can do frequent um, blood monitoring of specific analytes. And then you go into the data acquisition and tool validation, which will be the focus of the of my of the rest of my talk. So whether it's with pharma studies, collaborative studies, or using external data sets. Once you've validated, you start thinking about how do we how do we integrate this, this data alongside all of the other data that we're collecting in, uh, in, in studies or we have available, whether that's biomarker, real world evidence, clinical outcomes. So essentially you need an engineering approach of how to, how to integrate data and analytics. Um, and so, of course, harmonize all of the data so that you that you can um, do meta analyses on this data. So, regardless of which, let's say, actigraphy monitor we're using, wearable watch, um, we should be able to um, find a level of data that is comparable across different technologies. And obviously, at the output of there, of that is point of care biomarkers, digital endpoints, or or composite machine learning or AI derived novel endpoints where we're talking about multiple patterns rather than endpoints, singular endpoints. So let's go for the first example. Um, an example of uh, what we did in um, within uh, Janssen in a, in, a, in a collaborative manner with, uh, with various other teams that I work with to see if we can um, remotely monitor uh, inflam the inflammatory response using a wearable patch. Um, the the patch that we use in this case was the vital patch that I'll show in that we use in idea fast as well. Um, this measures heart rate, heart rate variability, skin temperature, respiratory ratio, uh, respiratory um, respirations, <laughs> and and motion. So what we were able to do is we were able to put these patches on on healthy volunteers which were subsequently injected with uh, lipopolysaccharide, which essentially elicits an, an, a strong immune response, which we wanted, we, we asked the question, can we actually um, detect this inflammatory response using this, um, this little wearable um, patch? So by doing some unsupervised clustering that uh, we were able to, 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 sh to um, detect distinct inflammatory states using this um, um, this technique and it was it was very very well nicely pronounced here so it, it gives us this um, this confidence that such technologies could be used and you could imagine all the different applications whether it's any diseases that um, have uh, inflammatory responses as, as part of them most recently obviously um, covid you know, looking at um, at the inflammatory response, looking at uh, essentially cytokine storms and other diseases which lend themselves to similar paradigms. Um, doing doing supervised learning, we actually could predict a cytokine response as well. We had done blood draws alongside the um, after post uh, LPS injection, and um, and you would you were able to actually show. I've, I have another slide which I'm not going to present at the moment, which shows a number of different cytokines which correlated very, very well with what we were seeing with uh, me measuring the, uh, the same elements with their vital patch. And this was some work done by one of my colleagues who um, worked also in the IMI project that Jan referred to. 
So then let's go back to, to essentially the um, extern external data sets, which are, I believe, a treasure trove. What I'm going to be discussing here is uh, some work um, that we did with um, data sets in the UK Biobank, which had um, 100,000 patients worth of actigraphy data. Um, what we were able to do there, that's the beauty of the UK Biobank, we were able to extract um, by using the ICD-10 codes all the different um, pop patients that uh, map to healthy individuals, so no ICD-10 code, Crohn's, rheumatoid, Sjogren's, um, SLE, ulcerative colitis, which was of interest to us in J&J. &J. Um, and then we were actually just raw um, actigraphy activity counts, accelerated average, you could see that there were pronounced and significant differences between these. So you use it as hypothesis building that yes, there is something here that we could we should go in and investigate more deeply. I'd like to also say that partnering is key. I think that is the that is if there was one catchphrase or one sort of motto for this talk is is that one. The partnering is key. Um, this was very much um, a case when we did uh, the Idea Fast project, uh, which um, I had the the pleasure and honor of working with Yan on. Um, which um, you can see here, it's identifying digital endpoints to assess fatigue, sleep, and activities of daily living, both in neurodegenerative and immune mediated inflammatory diseases. The project aims was to define the digital endpoints for perceived fatigue and sleep disturbances, and also seek scientific qualification advice by the EMA, FDA, and essentially look, um, create a database and a data set that could be used and post the project uh, end. What we did here is this is where we used multiple sensors across, um, so making patients look a little bit like cyborgs in two different uh, cohorts, where we put on um, different uh, sensors measuring different disease modalities or physiolo physiology modalities with the ultimate gain to see which ones we should use in a clinical validation study and, and then go ahead and seek uh, potentially a regulatory validation at the end of the project and that's it's it takes more than a village it takes pharmaceutical companies it takes um, small to medium enterprises it takes um the esteemed academic um world to actually work together in these pre-competitive um, to actually make this uh, work lastly i just let, like to sort of leave us here that it's not just that um, pharmaceutical companies are not in the, the business of making sensors. I would say the majority of us are not, but we are in the, um, in the business of finding out and partnering with companies that are developing such and essentially creating long lasting partnerships. This is a slide which is just a nice slide, to be honest with you, because it's outdated, but I think it shows very well up to 2017. It shows all of the different equity investment acquisitions in digital health companies. And um, it's not showing collaborations, but that's also, um, that's also part of what we do at Johnson & Johnson Innovation. So my day job is essentially to, um, to, um, to, to figure out, to help our internal um, teams identify partnering and uh, the appropriate partnering to enhance their own um, research. So then just, just a quick Google search, search this morning just shows that two of our key competitors, Sanofi and Bayer, are, are, are using, a two using digital technologies to reach stakeholders more effectively. It's just the, uh, what, whenever you Google, if you're on one of these like um, pharma forums on the internet, you'll see that these collaborations are coming through so frequently nowadays. Digital health investments has jumped 79% in 2021. I mean, you could imagine um, COVID being a very big push for that. There is a little bit of a plateau at the moment. I'm not going to get into that, but um, it's definitely here to stay. So it's um, an permanent position in, in pharma and business models. Um, and Sanofi is one of the companies conducting digital health. One of my uh, former collaborators, my former boss, is actually um, working in Sanofi doing these partnerships and uh, these positive outcomes with more, 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 growth, more growth to five, three years to come. And with that, I'd like to end it here and, um, and thank you very much again for the, uh, for the invite and allow some time for questions. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Yanis. Uh, uh, please join me for a, a, a round of virtual applause, at least as, as much as we can do uh, in these online forums. Uh, I believe we, we, we are reaching a, a nice broad audience this way. Um, so thank you for your presentation. Um, just as a reminder to the audience, you can type um, any questions you might have in the Q&A box, where you can also uh, feel free to raise your hand if you would like to ask your question. Um, and we can allow you to speak out uh, for a quick exchange about the question. So um, as 